joy of the Lord as we study the word of God together as we share the word of God it is my prayer that we will know the will of God for our lives and we will live to his glory and to his honor when you look around the world in which we live There are so many challenges. Humankind is advancing rapidly in science, technology, and social development. The overriding philosophy is that we are self-sufficient and can provide for our own security and determine our own future. But is this the case? Is that a reality on the ground? I know all of us, we have questions that have been troubling us, questions that have been challenging our minds. We have questions we have been pondering over, challenges we have been struggling with, where do we really come from? And why are we here? If there is a God after all, what does that God have to do with me? Perhaps you are a believer, but you are certain for deeper understanding in the Word of God. The Bible has more to offer than you have already discovered. What does God really expect of me? Does he really care when we suffer, when we go through pain, when we go through anguish? Is it true that we can do it on our own, individually, as a race? Or do we need the intervention of a supreme being in our lives? Will the castle of our dreams and destiny stand? Or will it depend on our relationship with God? God has answers for us from his word. And that is what this week we want to embark on a journey together. A journey to explore. A journey to know. To study the word of God. To understand it and to appreciate the word of God better. Shall we pray? Divine Father, as we open your word, we pray that you speak to us. Bless us through your word. Help us to understand your will for our lives. Help us to know the purpose for our lives, what you expect of us, and how we have to live. As we open your word, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. Speak to us, O God. Minister to us by the power of your Spirit. For Christ's sake. Amen. Where do we come from? That is what we want to look at today. Is it evolution or creation? We're going to look at chance versus design. Are we the handiwork of the Almighty God? Or are we products of evolution? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of science, falsely so-called. Tonight I want to say, if we really 
would like to reduce all the questions in the world down to only one question, it would simply be this. Did God make man? Is man the special creation of the Almighty God? Or is God the figment of man's imagination? This is a question that has been bothering us, that has been tormenting many people. They want to find solutions. Did God create man? Or did man make God? The theory of evolution, as purported by Charles Darwin in his book, The Origin of Species, claims that all life descended from one single primitive protozoa. From that protozoa, through mutation plus natural selection, life and life forms evolved. That is what he tells us. And this is something humanity, many people have believed. Where do we come from? How did we end up here? Evolution may be defined as the belief that multiplied millions of years ago, life began by natural causes from non-living matter. Then gradually, that original life changed. So from it came the modern kind of plants and animals, including man. Where do we come from? A question that has been challenging us. Robert Mueller, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, demonstrated the influence of our evolution doctrine in our world today when he said, I believe that the most fundamental thing we can do today is to believe in evolution. Why should we believe in evolution? Why should we accept evolution? But to him, evolution is the fundamental thing, is the standard, is what we need to believe in. If we believe in evolution, then we don't have to worry ourselves about a God whom we don't know, a God whom we cannot prove his existence. Therefore, we need evolution to help us so that we will not be worrying ourselves about God and who he is and what he has to do with us. Believers, the Bible teaches that the all-wise, all-powerful, eternal God created the universe and all forms of life in it, including humanity. So evolution and creation, we can say, are two fundamental competing beliefs about the origin of the universe, life and mankind. Evolution is competing with creation. Different people speculate and they tell us different things about evolution and how this world came into being. Some people speculate that we can believe both the Bible and the evolution. It can be put together. That is what some people believe. So there are different theories, different views parading among theologians and scientists about how this world came into existence. The first theory is the young earth creationist view. The young earth creationist view holds that the Bible provides an inerrant account of how the universe, all life, and humankind came into existence, namely in six 24-hour days, some six to 10,000 years ago. That is what young earth creationists subscribe to. Human beings were created through a direct act of divine intervention in the order of nature. That is what young creationists subscribe to. Another view is the old earth creationist view. This view holds that the sacred scripture is an infallible account of why the universe, 
all life and humankind came into existence. But except that the days of creation are, according to them, metaphorical and could represent very long period of time. It's true. What the Bible is saying is true. But that was just part of creation. That is not all creation. Whilst many aspects of nature may be the consequence of direct acts of divine creation, according to this view, at the very least, they hold that the very beginning of the universe, the origin of life and the origin of mankind are the consequences of the distinct acts of divine intervention in the order of nature. Another school of thought is what we call theistic evolutionists. They believe in God, but at the same time they also believe in evolution. So they try to merge evolution and creation together. They hold that the Bible provides an infallible account of why the universe is in existence. All of life and humankind, they say, came into existence. However, they also hold that, for the most part, the diversity of nature, from stars to plants to living organisms, including the human body, is a consequence of the divine using processes of evolution to create indirectly. Still, for many who hold this position, the very beginning of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin of what is distinct about humankind are the consequences of direct act of divine intervention in the order of nature. Another school of thought is evolutionary taste. They hold that the sacred text, the Bible, whilst giving witness to the ultimate divine source of all of nature, in no way specifies the means of creation. The Bible does not tell us the process, the means, how God created. Further, they hold that the witness of creation itself is that the divine creates only indirectly through evolutionary processes without any intervention in the order of nature. The question is, is it possible to believe both the Bible and the major tenets of evolution? Does evolution necessarily contradict the Bible? Can a Christian defend evolution and still be a faithful Christian? These are questions we need to ponder over. You see, many people believe that creation involves sudden major changes caused by God, but followed by gradual natural changes over billions of years. We are not here, friends, to discuss much scientific evidence for creation or against evolution, though such an exercise will be profitable. Neither are we here to emphasize the reasons why we believe the Bible. We believe in the Bible, not only because it agrees with science, but because of fulfilled prophecies in the Bible. There are so many miracles in the Bible that were performed by Jesus and his disciples. The resurrection and other proof abound in Scripture to tell us that indeed, Believing in the biblical account is better. In this study, we simply wish to see if the Bible can be harmonized with evolution. Is it possible? This is the theory of evolution. Someone has said the theory of evolution requires belief that nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. Nothing plus time plus chance equals anything you can see around. 
There are four questions that the evolutionist cannot answer. In spite of our knowing, in spite of the scientific discoveries, there are four questions that the evolutionists continue to struggle with, to answer. The first of it is the origin of life. If life began spontaneously from a molecule hitting the air, then how did the molecule originate in space before hitting the earth? That is a question scientists continue to struggle with. Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? Where did time come from? Spontaneous generation or a fictitious concourse of atoms does not answer the question of our origin. I want to say that evolution is a philosophy. A scientist by name D.M.S. Watson once stated that evolution is universally accepted theory, not because it can be proven, but because the only alternative which is special creation is incredible. Hence, they believe in evolution. Another challenge that the evolutionists struggle to understand, to explain, is the fixity of the species. We are told that we evolve, there is change. But I've been looking forward to a day that me, as a man, I will change to become something else in order to believe in evolution. Why are we not changing? Why are we still what we are? Why the fixity of the species? This is another question for our consideration. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, as you read the creation account, you hear the word of God saying, after its kind, it was created after its what? Kind. Bible talks about species and each one coming after its kind. We have many kinds of roses, for, for instance. There exist many kinds of felons or cats, the cat family. Breeding and cross-breeding, yes, they are possible. This simply means that one species does not change or adapt into a completely different species. You cannot turn from what you are to another thing. That is something the evolutionists continue to struggle with. The third problem of evolution has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics states that energy can never be destroyed, but continually becomes less available for further work as it unravels. Simply put, everything tends to wear out and to run down. That is the second law of thermodynamics. Everything is marked by death, decay, and disintegration. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. It says, For we know that the whole earth groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. There is problem in creation. There is decay. There is disintegration. How do we explain the decay in creation? How do we explain the disintegration in creation? For the biblical believer or the Bible believer, this is as a result of sin. Period. We believe that as a result of sin, the perfect creation of God has been marred. There is decay. There is destruction. There is disintegration in creation. But the scientists cannot explain why. We know that due to sin, there is a curse upon creation. And it tends to wind down. The evolutionist, however, holds to the thought that over time, things become more complex and move towards precision rather than decay. That given enough time, disorganized things become organized. When you look at evolution carefully, 
That is what it's trying to prove to us. How do certain properties exist that have nothing to do with the survival of the fittest? That is another question that the evolutionists continue to struggle with. Where did music come from? And what is its relationship to the survival of the fittest? Where did love come from? Where did honor and dignity come from? Where did we get the concept of Almighty God? These questions cannot be answered by survival of the fittest. We are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thoughtful God. God thought about you. He thought about your creation. He knows your existence. He has a purpose for your life. He created you. He created me with an intention. That is the God we say. We are not the product of chance. We come from the mind of a purposeful God. A God who took his time to design us and he has a purpose for our life. And until we know that purpose and fulfill that purpose, friends, we will not have peace of mind. We need to know the purpose of our creation. We need to know why we were created and why we are here on this earth. World Magazine, some time ago, named Philip Johnson, a law professor at the University of California, as the Daniel of the Year for his work in dismantling the Darwinist empire that dominated American culture. In 1991, Philip Johnson sparked an enormous controversy by publishing Darwin on Trial, a book. Taking Darwinists on their own terms, he concluded that the arguments that they put forward lacked sufficient evidence to back up their sweeping conclusions. In the year since then, he continued his attack on Darwinism through a steady stream of articles, books, speeches, debates, and other public discussions. He knows that many Christian leaders think the evolution creation debate doesn't really matter, but they are wrong. And not just wrong, they are terribly misguided. He says, the fundamental question is whether God is real or imaginary. The entire way of thinking that underlies Darwinian evolution assumes that God is out of the picture. Darwinism does not accept God. Darwinism does not believe in God. So if you believe in God and you subscribe to evolution, then there is a problem. You cannot believe in God and at the same time believe in evolution. He goes on to say that his greatest frustration comes from dealing with the secular, not from the secular scientists, not from those who do not believe the Bible, but from Christian leaders who believe evolution and the Christian faith are ultimately compatible. Friends, evolution and creation can never be compatible. It does not die. It does not agree. But that is what many Christians subscribe to. Say the more frustrating thing I think has been the Christian leaders and pastors, very good pastors, especially Christian college and seminary professors, yet they believe that evolution and creation can come together. Friends, we don't have to believe this. The Bible, God created humanity for a purpose. He says that is his worry. We need to allow God to speak to us. Professor Johnson is right on all terms. What should we learn from the ongoing controversy? I want to say that evolution and creationism is a class of competing worldviews. The debate is not about dinosaurs and DNA. It is really a debate between competing worldviews. Evolution at its heart views the world through a lens that is entirely naturalistic. 
It proposes to explain the entire universe without reference to God. As Johnson says, the evolutionist assumes that God is out of the picture. Either he doesn't exist or he doesn't matter. So if you believe in evolution, the implication is that either God does not exist or he does not matter. And that is not a small thing. Since in evolutionary thinking, there is no such thing as ultimate truth. Only an endless series of theories. First believed, then doubted, and then discarded. That is what goes on in the scientific sphere. An evangelical theologian by name, Al Mola, offers this explanation. He says, for over 100 years, the dominant scientific establishment has been moving towards an enforced orthodoxy of naturalism, materialism, and secularism. According to this view, the universe is a closed box that can be understood only on its own terms, with everything inside the box explained only by other matters and processes within the same box. The box itself is explained as a cosmic accident. And naturalistic science allows no place for a designer or a design in the entire cosmos. Evolution, as a worldview, leaves God out. Either he doesn't exist or he doesn't matter. That is why compromised positions such as theistic evolution never works. They attempt to join two things. Creation and evolution, that is not possible. They are fundamentally incompatible. I realize there are many Christians, including some who hold to a high view of Scripture, who believe in evolution as the best explanation of the origin of the human race. At the best, they are inconsistent in their faith. At worst, they have undermined the authority of the Bible by accommodating a contrary worldview. Everything starts with the God who created us. Start anywhere else and you will be perpetually confused. And that is what is happening in our world. Everything starts with God. The Christian worldview rests upon the truth that God created all things. We created God in our own image and likeness. According to comedian George Carlin, he said that we have created God in our own image and likeness. But I want to say we did not create God. We did not create God. But we did create a God just like us. And that is the basic problem of humankind and the human race. The Christian worldview stands 180 degrees removed from the evolutionary worldview. The biblical writers repeatedly ascribe all of creation to the work of God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Hebrews 11, 3. Genesis 1 tells us something important about how God created. Repeatedly, the text says, And God said, and God said, first, there was a God who created. We have God's creative word. When you read John chapter 1, and John says, in the beginning was the word. John knew what he was referring to. John was referring to Jesus Christ as the creative word of God. When he made reference to the in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning, God created. The Bible says, and God said. 
Then the waters. God said he spoke. In the first place when he spoke, the light appeared. Then the waters were separated. Then there were dry ground. Then vegetations came into existence. Then the sun, moon, and stars were formed. Then came the fish and the birds. Then the land animals. And finally, Adam and Eve were created. Eight times the phrase is repeated in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, He spoke and light shined through the darkness. He spoke and the waters receded from the earth. God spoke and dry land appeared. God spoke and the vegetations appeared. He spoke and the sun filled the sky by day and millions of stars twinkled by the night. It was the word of God. God spoke, friends. He spoke and the sea teemed with fish and birds began to fly. God spoke and the cattle grazed, squirrels gathered north, and all creation came together through the word of God. That is what the Bible tells us. Finally, he spoke and he created Adam and Eve. And the Bible says he breathed into man, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living being. And when Adam got lonely, God took a rib from his side and he created Eve. Thus did the human race begin. That is the explanation of the Bible, which is contrary to what evolutionists tell us. The Bible tells us plainly that the universe exists by God's command. He spoke and it came into being. The Bible emphasizes this truth in a number of places. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, verse 6, he says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33, verse 9 says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and he stood fast. Amen. Psalm 148, verse 5 says, For he commanded, and they were created. He commanded. Theologians say he spoke ex nihilo. He created out of nothing. He spoke and it came into existence. Psalms 148 verse 5. He commanded and they were created. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 5 also says, For by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water. Believers, that is what the Bible tells us. That is the plain truth. There is no theory behind it. It is simple truth that the Almighty God created this world out of nothing. He spoke and everything came into existence. This week, I was reading Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. When you read Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, in heaven, we are told the 24 elders, who represents the redeemed of all ages, cast their crown before the throne of God and worship Him. This is what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. That is what the 24 elders are saying by casting down their crown. They say, God, you are worthy. Why is God worthy? God is worthy of our praise because he created this earth. A few verses later, when you go to Revelation chapter 5, you discover that these same elders, they fall down and worship the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the redemption he purchased with his own blood. And they also say, 